Well, Shabbat Shalom and welcome. I'm Rabbi Ed Feinstein, and this is Torah Study, Valley Beth Shalom Torah Study for a Shabbos morning. I'm delighted to welcome you this morning. I'm uh, flying solo. My partners are all taking care of families and doing important things, so I'm delighted to spend some time together with you. Um, this week, those of us in L.A. are celebrating our blue and white Shabbat because uh, the Dodgers did fairly well, and I apologize to the Yankee fans and the crowd, but next year is another year. And nice to be together with all of you. We had Simchas Torah about a week ago. And last week, uh, on the edge of Simchas Torah, we began reading the beginning of the book of Genesis. This week, we're in the second Torah portion of Genesis, which is the second act of a great drama. The first act of the drama is God's creation of the world. And God seeks a partner, someone to share the wonder of creation and someone to share the responsibilities of running, maintaining this world. And that's why human beings were created and charged with the responsibility to care for the world. But we disappointed God. We were given one simple task, and that is to remain in the garden and care for it, but not touch the tree in the middle. But you know, human beings have this streak in us. And it's so interesting that human development is described in the Bible as, as an attitude of rebellion. And so we disobeyed the rule because we were created in the image of the creator. And the most important project of creation that any of us ever take on in our lives is the creation of ourselves, of our own personalities, our own character, our own destinies. And even living in the Garden of Eden, with all of its glories, with all of our needs cared for, with all of its peace and wonder, wasn't, a, wasn't competition for the opportunity to shape our own destinies, to shape our own lives. And so we eat from the fruit, we're cast out of the garden, and the world fills with violence for a very simple reason. Because once you start choosing self over the project of caring for the world, once you choose ego and all of its impulses and all of its desires and all of its needs over the caring of a world, well, then pretty soon the world begins to fracture and fall apart. And at the end of last week's Torah portion, it ends in a very, very remorseful, regretful way. God says, why did I create this human being? And God is about to destroy it when God's eye catches one man, one human being, who seems to have moral potential. And his name, of course, is Noah. And the second story is God chooses this one and says, you are now in charge. I'm going to wipe out everyone else and start over with you. Act two, I couldn't create a partner. Perhaps I can choose one. Perhaps you're the one. And God starts again and wipes away all of the life on the planet, save the, the animals that Noah saves in his ark and his family. And they come out of the ark and they repopulate the world and well, it doesn't turn out well either. And we're going to see next week God's third attempt. God's third attempt, of course, is going to be with Father Abram because he, God realizes that if I couldn't create a partner and I couldn't choose a partner, maybe, maybe I can teach one. Maybe I can teach one human being and the family of that human being and the posterity of that human being to embrace my vision of a world of justice a world of peace, a world of promise. And God chooses Abram and begins again. That's next week's Torah portion. But just before we get to next week, just before we get to Abram, at the end of the Noah story is a tiny gem of a biblical narrative. It's familiar to many of us, of course. It's about this tower in a funny place called Babel. And well, this is a strange and interesting story. And it's such a powerful narrative because it is so, in many ways, opaque. And so it invites levels of interpretation. And I would suggest that they were planted there as the story was written because you can see clues all through the story. Let's take a look at it together. I'm going to put it up here on the screen. I'll read it out loud for those who are listening. It's Genesis 11. Everyone on earth had the same language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, that's from where Noah landed, and came upon a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there, they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them hard. 
brick serve them as stone and bitumen. That's uh, uh, muddy stuff in the river. Serve them as mortar. And they said, come, let us build a city and a tower with its top in the sky to make a name for ourselves, else we shall be scattered all over the world. The Lord came down to look at the city and the tower that man had built. And the Lord said, if as one people with one language for all, this is how they've begun to act, well, then nothing they proposes, they may propose to do will be out of their reach. Let us go down and confound their speech there so they might not understand one another's speech. Thus the Lord scattered them from the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the city. And that's why it was called Babel because the Lord confounded the speech of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. That's it. That's the whole story. Nine verses, no more. But so filled with so much meaning. So let's take a look at line by line. Let's go through this together. Genesis 11, everyone on earth had the same language and the same words. Well, it's interesting because we interpret diversity as a virtue. We understand that a society that embraces diversity and has room for multiple cultures and multiple ways of being and multiple perspectives, well, that makes us a stronger society and more colorful society. Here, here where I live, you can drive down the boulevard and you can eat Japanese food or Israeli food or Mexican food or Chinese food or American food on one boulevard, on one block. And that kind of diversity, that kind of cultural pluralism adds color to our lives and makes us a stronger society because the diversity, when it's really open to the diversity, that diversity gives us an opportunity to see the world through multiple different perspectives and multiple different um, ideals. And yet here, the idea is that once upon a time, we started out. So the question is, if we started out from one family, Noah and his kids, how did we end up with cultural pluralism? And the unique part of this story, which is somewhat strange, is that it's not given us as a gift. It's given us as a punishment. That is, we abused the uniformity of huma human culture and turned it into a weapon. We turned it into a weapon where we denied anyone who was different a place. We'll talk about that in a moment. We turned it into a weapon because we challenged heaven. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. We violated God's vision of the world. God, after all, created many, many different kinds of animals. Because after all, why wouldn't you just create one animal? Why do you need dogs and cats and cows and sheep? Because biodiversity gives us a stronger biome. It gives us a stronger ecology. And in the same way, wouldn't you think that diversity would be a better way to form human culture but this pro this talks to it as as a um as a problem now here's the great mystery of the story what was the sin when we get to the middle of the story god's going to see this and god's going to object to it what was the sin so the first sin that i'm going to suggest is the possibility that earth had the same language because they enforced it that way because they didn't make room for difference because they didn't make room for opportunities of different perspectives, that any culture that tries to suppress the natural diversity of human perspectives, the natural diversity of human cultures, the natural diversity of, of human languages, that culture becomes weaker in the same way that a biosphere, that a, a natural world becomes weaker when there isn't a diversity of plants and animals that give us a, a, a way of surviving and resilience in a, in a changing world. That was the first sin. But now let's take a look a little bit deeper. Here's a strange thing. They migrated from the east and they came to a valley in the land of Shinar. And ultimately, the name of the city is going to become Babel. Well, it turns out that there was a real place called Babel, or in Hebrew, Babel, or in English, Babylonia, which actually was in the land of Shinar. And you recall the story. In 586 BCE, before zero, the Babylonian Empire, a great Mesopotamian empire in what is today Iraq, 
Babal was right outside of where Baghdad is today, came across the Fertile Crescent to control the ancient Near East, to control the highways between Mesopotamia and Egypt. And they bumped into Jerusalem, which had rebelled against them. And in 586 BCE, they destroyed the city of Jerusalem, exiled its population, and destroyed the Holy Temple. They exiled the leaders of the population. So imagine now Israelite leaders from Jerusalem who had lived in the city of Jerusalem, which really wasn't a city at all. It was a town, small town, actually, taken away as it was the Babylonian policy taken away to the great imperial palace by the waters of Babel. That's where we sat and where we wept as we remembered Zion. Well, we did more than sit and weep because the Babylonians allowed us a certain degree of freedom there in Babel as exiles. Their idea was living in the imperial capital of Babel, we would assimilate. In a generation or two, we would begin to speak Babylonian language, adopt Babylonian customs. Our children would go to Babylonian high schools, go play football for the Babylonian football team. And on Friday nights, they would go out to McBabbles and have a Mc whatever. And pretty soon in a generation or two, we would assimilate away. That was the Babylonian or the Mesopotamian strategy for pacifying a conquered area. You didn't destroy the people. You simply assimilated them. That's what happened to the northern kingdom of Israel when it was conquered by the Assyrians. The 10 lost tribes were not lost. They were exiled to the Assyrian capital of Nineveh and assimilated into the life and culture of Assyrian culture. That's what the Babylonians assumed would happen to the Judeans and the south. Now, for just a moment, imagine the scene. So here are these Judeans who had grown up and lived their entire lives in the small town of Judea, of Jerusalem, suddenly in the big city, the metropolis, the cosmopolitan metropolis of Babylon, capital of a great empire that had conquered dozens and dozens of ancient civilizations. And so as you walk through the streets of Babel, what would you hear? Well, you'd hear dozens of languages. People would have a hard time communicating with each other because not everybody spoke the language of the empire, which was Aramaic. And you'd see the product of a diverse multicultural empire trying to hold itself together. Incidentally, that's going to be its downfall in a generation or two when it will not be able to cohere and will be very quickly conquered by the Persian empire. And incidentally, Babel or Babylon in the Valley of Shinar, had a tower in its middle. Babel had a giant man-made pyramid called the Ziggurat, and the Tower of Babel really existed. It was the man-made pyramid, the sacred man-made mountain of the empire of the Babylonians, and there, in the beginning of the fall month of Tishrei, which corresponds to our Rosh Hashanah, was the, was the holiday of the crowning of the Babylonian emperor and the designation of the Babylonian emperor as the adopted son of the god Marduk, who was the patron god of the Babylonian empire. So in a certain way, what this story is, is a political commentary. It's a political commentary on what happens when a great nation, when a great empire tries to confound the lives of multiple nations without forming a coherent core culture of its own. And here, too, it now becomes a reflection of the lived experience of the ancient Israelites. Well, let's go a little farther. Look at the next line. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them hard. And then the Bible adds a comment. It's a gloss. Bricks serve them as stone and bitumen serve them as mortar. Bricks and mortar, bricks and bitumen as mortar, represent a replacement for the natural, well, the natural ingredients, the natural materials of stone and mud. Now, what does that mean? Well, brick as a, as a man-made object has advantages over stone. If you're building a home or a building of any kind or a man-made tower, 
You can't build it out of stone. You can build it out of stone, but it's very hard because you have to make do with the multiple sizes and shapes and the roundness of stones. And how do you form a large building out of that with structural integrity? So as long as you're building out of stone or out of wood for that matter, you're limited about how big the building can be. But once you use bricks, which are uniform and flat, and you find a way to create mortar that holds them concrete to hold them together. Well, now you can really build something big. In other words, build bricks and, and mortar are the first examples of technology. Perhaps the sin of Babel was the sin of technology, of technology, because what does technology do? Technology replaces re extends rather it extends human capacity and the question of technology in every generation starting with bricks and mortar is what happens if the power of your technology exceeds the power of your wisdom to use the technology wisely what happens when the technology begins to rule you instead of you ruling the technology. Now, when I was a kid, one of our favorite things to do, my dad would come home early on a on a weekend afternoon, Sunday afternoons, and at five o'clock on Channel 11 in LA was sci-fi theater. Every Sunday afternoon at five o'clock, they would play science fiction movies and my dad would gather my brothers and me and the, we'd all sit on the floor with a gallon of thrifty arts ice cream and we would watch we would watch science fiction movies of the 1950s and early 60s, and they were always the same movie. There was a movie where they, where, where the, the, the town, the little Western town is attacked by, now you fill in the blank, attacked by giant grasshoppers, attacked by giant ants, attacked by giant, uh, uh, giant spiders, once even attacked by giant rabbits, because what happened? Well... They built the nuclear plant next to the stream and they vented the nuclear plant's water into the stream. And that's how you ended up with giant grasshoppers threatening the town. And the, the army had to come out and they had to find the way to fight back against the giant grasshoppers. It's the same story. Same story, by the way. The other movie we used to watch are the Godzilla movies from Japan. Same story. It's had to do with nuclear testing in the Pacific, right? It's all about technology. And what happens when technology, the power of our technology, exceeds our wisdom? Today, of course, the question is AI, artificial intelligence. What happens if we, if we create computers that are so much smarter than us that they start to replace us? They start to do things that we didn't program them to do. Then they start telling us how to create our lives. The, first, the next sort of level of the story is a question of when human beings create technology that's stronger than they are, extends their power and makes them almost like God. Take another look at look the next line. They said to themselves, let's build a city with a tower in its with a, with a tower and its top in the sky. Now there's two things there. I want to point this out. Number one is the city. The Bible hates cities. Wherever you see, according to the Bible, the first city was started by Cain, who was a refugee after killing his brother Abel. Cities bothered the Bible, and for good reason. Because when we lived in towns and villages, which is how human beings lived for the first 8,000 years of our existence, when we lived in towns and villages, everybody knows each other. And even though that might repress your freedom to be free of your family's legacy, the fact is that everyone was noticed, everyone was seen, and everyone had a role and a certain sense of the meaning of life. But when you move into a city, there's something morally pra problematic about cities because cities involve anonymity. You stop being who you are. You're not living in a place where everybody knows you. You can become anybody you, you want to be you can also hide and not just hide on the opposite. You can also disappear. I mean, one of the things that the prophets of the Bible point out again and again, the prophet Micah and the prophet Isaiah, prophet Hosea, is that you have prostitution in cities. 
You don't have it in villages because everybody knows that girl and everybody knows her family. But in the city, she's anonymous and her, well, they call them Johns. Her clients are anonymous. And so you can have that level of degradation, a woman who sells her body, and it seems to be acceptable because it's anonymous. She doesn't, we don't know who she is, and therefore, in a certain way, she doesn't exist. In our time, we have thousands of people who live on the streets. They are anonymous to us. We don't know them. We don't know their stories. And so we can ignore them. They become socially invisible. And so the next sin of Babel, the next level of the sin, is the sin of the city. And what happens to human beings in a city? Again, if you don't mind me quoting movies, remember the first King Kong movie. I think it was about 1937, 1939. The same year that the Empire State Building was opened was the year that the movie King Kong, the first one, which was the best one, came out. And if you remember the end of that movie, right, they go to this scary island somewhere in the, in the, in the vast cold reaches of the world, and they find this enormous creature, King Kong, the most powerful creature in the world. And they bring him back to New York City in chains, and they put him up in a theater, and and the 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 uh, the, the uh, uh, impresario presents him as entertainment, and he breaks out of the chains, and he grabs Fay Ray, and he starts climbing up the side of the Empire State Building, and the higher he climbs, the smaller he gets, and by the time King Kong, the most mighty creature of nature, the mightiest creature that nature has reaches the top of the Empire State Building, you realize that he's just a monkey. He's very small. And then the airplanes come and they can do something which nothing in nature could do. They could fell the great mighty Kong. And you realize that that movie is not about the monkey, the, the ape as a monster. It's about the city as a monster, the buildings as a monster, the, 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 the way that we create cities, the way that we create civilizations that dwarf everything in nature and dwarf us and make us tiny and insignificant and unimportant. And that's what King Kong is about. And at the end, you feel sorry for him when he falls from, I gave away the ending, I'm sorry, but it was made in 1937. He falls from the top of the mountain and the top of the, 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 the building, and he dies at the bottom, and you realize that we have just felled nature's greatest creation, and we are so small and so, so puny compared to what we've created. The monster was the city, not the ape. That's the next sin. So we've talked about technology, and we've talked about cities, and we've talked about empires, and now we get to a religious meaning of the story. Let us build a city with a tower and its top in the sky. The Midrash, the great Midrashim of the Jewish tradition understood that the reason they built this tower was to conquer God. And the Midrash gives wonderful reasons about why they would want to conquer God. Some were resentful for what God did in times of Noah. They wanted to take over control of the universe so that God would never flood the world again. Others simply wanted to be, well, God. And they wanted to build a tower so they could reach into the sky. The Midrash pictures the, Midrash pictures the soldiers of Babel going to the top of the mountain and shooting arrows into the sky. And some of them fall down with blood on their tips and they say, we have conquered God. We have become God. When people, human beings, wish to be God and don't understand their limitations, the limitations on their wisdom, limitations on their desires, limitations on their impulses, what happens to the world? That becomes the next piece of this. This is a condemnation of that kind of hubris, that excessive arrogance of the human being who manages himself as God. Elie Wiesel, the wonderful, wonderful author, tells a tiny folktale. He says, once God and man were talking 
And God complained that it's so hard to run a universe. He's so tired. There's so much to do. And man complained that there's so much to do in man's world. And so man proposes to God, I'll tell you what, why don't we switch places for just a moment? And you can see what it's like to be a human being. And I can see what it's like to be God. And God says, we sell. God agreed for just a moment. We'll switch places. And so God rose from God's throne and moved over to the human chair. And the human being climbed himself up on God's throne and ruled the universe for a moment. And then when God turned to the human being and said, now we switch back, the human being refused to get out of God's chair. He refused to let God rule the universe. And that is the horror of the world we live in. Wiesel, remember, is a survivor of Auschwitz, a place where man played God and thought that he could be God and all of his hate and his rage and his contempt and his narrow-mindedness and his prejudice became ultra-powerful, omnipotent in that world. And that's the world that you see, said Wiesel, when man thinks he can play God, and that's the Tower of Babel story. That's another layer of this. One more. How do you build a tower? You know, if you build a house, you get a, a group of workmen together and they start building a house, but if you're just a house, but if you're going to build something that's bigger than a house, like a city and a tower, you can't do it that way you end up with something called specialization. You have bricklayers, those who mix the mortar. You have carpenters. In our time, you would have electricians and plumbers. And then you have architects who guide the workmen. And then you have foremen who are the liaisons between the architects and the and the workers. And then you have those who are above the architects who, who design the, the whole area. And then you have the owners. And if you think about that, what you end up with is, yes, a tower. It's a, it's a triangular formation with the working people at the bottom and the foremen and supervisors above them and the designers and architects above them and the owners and the, 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 the ones who determine the real fate of the area on top of them, and you end up with a pyramid. And the problem with pyramid structures, while they are efficient, and they allow us, the specialization allows us to do great things. The problem is that soon enough, the people at the bottom are simply seen as less important than the people at the top. There's a Midrash in Midrash Rabbah that says that when they were building this tower and a brick fell from the top and they were carrying bricks up the side of the tower to place them above, so it went higher and higher. If a brick fell from on top, they would stop and mourn. But if a man fell on top, well, he was replaced immediately. We all become the materials of this project. And we cease to be the infinitely precious human beings that we are. There's a, a song by the, Brooke, by the group uh, Pink Floyd that says, all in all, we're just a, another brick in the wall. And it's a very sad thought that that's what technical, technical civilization makes of us. It makes us replaceable and ultimately dispensable. And the other problem with that pyramid structure, which we call in our culture bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is, after all, a pyramid structure. You've got a guy on top and people below him in various, in various configurations until you get to the people at the bottom. The other problem with the bureaucratic structure, powerful as it might be, is that responsibility gets lost in all of this. Who is ultimately responsible for something that goes awry? I don't know if you remember many, many years ago, one of the space shuttles exploded. I think it was the Challenger that exploded um, on launch. It was a terrible tragedy. Terrible tragedy. It was watched on television by everybody. And the problem with it was they had a commission of inquiry after that. And they went looking for who's responsible. And no surprise, they couldn't find anybody responsible. 
because the managers at Morton Thiokol that built it said, we told them not to launch. And the NASA people said, we were told we had to launch. And the astronauts said, we just follow orders from the engineers. And the engineers said, we were listening to the managers. And soon enough, nobody was responsible because what bureaucracy does is chop up any particular task into such tiny, minute pieces that any one player in the system is capable of saying, well, it's not my responsibility. I'm just doing my job. And the most famous one who ever said that, you remember, was Adolf Eichmann. Adolf Eichmann, who was the man in the Nazi regime responsible for the trains. He wrote train schedules. That's what the guy did. And he was so good at marshalling the resources of the German state transportation system for the sole purpose of murdering Jews, that even when the Germans were losing the war, even when they desperately needed their resources to carry on the war effort, Eichmann made it possible to murder 400,000 Hungarian Jews. And when the Israelis captured and kidnapped him in 1961 from his hiding place in Argentina, brought him back to Jerusalem for trial, what was his defense? I didn't kill Jews. I didn't kill anybody. I like Jews. I have Jewish friends, he said. All I did was write train schedules. That was my job. If you take a task and divide it up into small enough bits so that Anyone can simply say, all I did was this little thing. I'm not responsible. Then human responsibility gets lost and nobody can be held responsible. And that's the other sin of bureaucracy. There's one more piece of this, however, and that's what I'd like to finish with. Why did they build the tower ultimately? What do they say? And look at here. Come, let us build a city with a tower at its top and the sky to make a name for ourselves, else we be scattered all over the world. Well, what are they saying? The, the greatest human fear, according to psychologists, according to philosophers, the greatest human fear is not the fear of pain or the fear of death or the fear of failure. The greatest human fear is the fear of oblivion. To have lived, to have struggled, to have suffered, to have triumphed, and then to be wiped away and no one knows that we lived. Make no mark on the world. To have nothing that lasts beyond our very few years in the vast expanse of time. And so it is an impulse within the human being to attach ourselves to those things which are more lasting than ourselves, more permanent, even to attach ourselves to that which is eternal. Why is it? Why is it that people build buildings and put their names in big lights on the top of the building? Why is it that we create symphonies and paint masterpieces? Why is it that we write books? And why is it that we hang accolades on our walls because we want the world to know that I am. There is actually a television program called uh, American Idol, you know, because in American culture, the greatest thing you can have is fame. Remember that song from that movie or the TV show? The, the lyric was fame. I want to live forever. People will know my name. People will know that I am. And so people will go on television and do all sorts of weird, strange, wacko things just so they can make a mark on the world. And people will know that I exist. And what do these guys try to do? We'll build a tower. And our tower will have our name. And we will be someone. We will attach ourselves to the tower. And we can point to it and say, that's my immortality. Don't you see? because otherwise we'll be scattered all over the world and no one will know that we were. And so God, as it were, comes down. And the God of this story is not a sophisticated theology. This is the folksy God of the first chapters of Genesis. God, as it were, comes down to look 
It takes a walk in the city. And he sees the tower. And God worries that with one language, with uniformity, they can do this. If one language allows them to build technology that they will use to destroy themselves, if with one language and this quality of uniformity, they will destroy all the diversity among them, with one language, they will build empires that simply conquer and grab all the wealth of the world and suppress other peoples and cultures. If with one language, they build cities where people disappear in social invisibility. If with one language, they create bureaucratic structures that make people, human beings disappear and responsibility evaporate. If with one language, they rebel against heaven and wish no limits on their reach, then we can't let them have this. They're not ready for this quality of power. They're not ready to deal with this quality. These, these, these extensions of their own hands and their own imaginations. So let's take it away from them. And God confounds their speech so suddenly they can't work together anymore. Now, that's a strange thing, isn't it? Because we do have multiple speech now. We speak many languages, we come from many cultures, and yet we have figured out how to do it. There's two ways to do it, of course. One is authoritarian, that you can enslave the other, and that's going to be our experience in Egypt. But the other, of course, is human cooperation. If I can communicate to you, and you can communicate to me, that we see each other's humanity, then I will learn your language and you will learn mine and we will work together to create that world. But in the process of recognizing each other's humanity and each other's values and each other's deep personal existential significance, your value, well, the world we will create, the, the technology we will develop, the cities we will create, will not be cities which are ungodly and technology which is threatening, but it'll be a technology, a city, a center of love, of justice, of compassion. And that's the ultimate story here. And one more thing. What they wanted most of all, of course, was to make a name for themselves. Notice something interesting about this story? Nobody except God is named. No names. But in the very next chapter, we have a name. A man who found the way to have a name in the world and not be scattered all over the world. In fact, even if he was scattered all over the world, which is one of God's promises to his descendant, he will always have a name. And that man's name is Avram. And the very next chapter, look what God says to him. God now has learned something about us. We have this need for immortality, this need to touch eternity, this need to gain our existential significance and defeat that terrible fear of oblivion by making a name for ourselves. And so God says, okay, I'll give you the right way to do it. Building a building won't do it, my friend, says God, because you know what? You build a building, you put your name on it. In a generation, they scrape your name, put someone else's name on it. That's not how you do it. Certainly not the way they did it. But go forth from your native land, from your father's house, says God to Abram. Go away from the culture that raised you. Come into the world and let me recreate you as my partner to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great. There's the promise. And what do you need to do? Be a blessing. Can you be a blessing? Can you be a blessing? By being a blessing to my world, look at the next line, I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you and all the families of the earth shall be blessed by you. And Abram went forth. If you will be a blessing, says God, then you will have a name and that name will last forever. And that's the next chapter of our story. God's third attempt to find a partner in the world is Abram. I couldn't create a partner. I couldn't choose one. I'm going to teach one. And that's the chapter we're still in today. God waiting for us to step forward as partners in the work of creating a world of justice 
and a world of compassion. That's what God's waiting for us to do now. And if we will do it, says God, then my reward to you is you will have a name and you will have eternity and you will have a life that matters. Well, thank you for sharing this with me. I hope it's a very, very good Shabbos. There is an election this year. You might have heard about that. If you haven't already done it by ballot, by absentee ballot or whatever ballot you use, then please, our vote is important. Our voices are important. I had a, an uncle who was an immigrant to America. For him, election day was yontif. It was a holiday. He'd put on his very best suit, take off his very, take on his very best hat, walk himself proudly to the polling place, announce his name to the poll workers, because for him, having grown up in Eastern Europe, where a Jew had nothing and no voice at all, for him to be an American citizen possessed of a voice, a vote, was such an honor. It should be an honor for all of us. Take a few minutes, read over the ballot. If you live here in California, and I know in many other places, the ballot propositions take a little while to figure out. So read them over, read some of the endorsements of places you trust, and vote because it recognizes our common humanity. And let's pray that we remain strong and united as a country, no matter who wins this election. And let's pray that we all find a better way in the year to come. Shana Tova, a happy, healthy New Year. See you next Shabbos. Be well.